Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So recently, one of my fellow hair loss witchers sent me a thread from the Tressless subreddit, which initially made me think I was getting trolled, since Reddit has never forgiven me for making that video where I debunked their stupid broccoli theory, and I'll link that video below if you don't know what I'm talking about. It turns out, though, this post doesn't originally come from Tressless. I am not sure of its origin, but it has been getting a lot of traction as of late in the hair loss community, and unlike like the broccoli nonsense, which was just a bunch of bro science, this post is admittedly pretty interesting and definitely more worthy of a scientific breakdown than some hypothetical connection between the 3-AHSD enzyme, hair loss, and broccoli consumption. But enough about that crap. Let's take a look at the latest du jour hypothetical hair loss treatment that has taken the hair loss community by absolute storm. This one is about a protein called Twist One, and the title of the post in question is, quote, Twist One and the Cure. Is it really that easy?" Unquote. Well, that's a pretty clickbaity title, and immediately I was worried that this could be yet another theory that explains everything, but as it turns out, the poster added a subtitle to it. It reads, quote, this is a long-ass post, but I think it's worth the read, more than broccoli at the very least, unquote. Well, the guy who posted this is at least smart enough to know that Reddit's broccoli boy is full of shit, so he's got my attention here. At the very least, this Twist 1 protein is worthy of a scientific breakdown, so maybe Reddit's standards have grown a bit ever since I debunked their ridiculous broccoli theory. So anyways, let's take a scalpel to this post. Like I said, the post talks about something called Twist 1, which is a signaling protein that I haven't talked about before four, and that may be a regulator of hair growth. Now, I've talked about other signaling pathways on this channel before, like the WNT Wind pathway and the Sonic Hedgehog pathway, and these pathways are all regulators of the hair growth cycle, and I'll link some videos of these pathways below if you're interested in learning more about them. But I've never talked about Twist One specifically before, so I figured after reading this Reddit post that it would be worth going balls deep into the subject despite me and Reddit not exactly having a cordial relationship thanks to my brother broccoli video last year. Now, as it turns out, there are a couple of odd things I noticed about this Reddit post. For one thing, like I mentioned before, the original poster was not in fact the original poster, since this post was apparently copied from some other hair loss form, and the Redditor who posted this admitted in the comment section. Also, the post author mentions a group buy where he encourages people to invest in an anti-twist one drug, but he says he can't reveal who is sponsoring the group buy. So that's pretty mysterious, and maybe this is yet again someone who's trying to make a quick buck. In fact, it reminded me of the broccoli guy who, after posting his idiotic theory and even admitting that I debunked him, still had the nerve to start a fundraiser where he asked for $70,000, which would be nowhere near enough money to fund an actual study to further test his theory. Rather, what he wanted to do is he wanted the $70,000 so he could start a business selling some snake oil broccoli topical, and his only source that it worked was based on a few anecdotes from his own Discord. So it's obvious the whole Reddit broccoli theory thing was a complete scam designed to separate desperate Redditors from their money. What's really sad is that this broccoli post is the most popular post in Tressless's history. So please, Tressless readers, learn to show a little bit more skepticism and critical thinking skills. When some random guy with zero scientific background claims to have a theory that explains everything, yet gets basic hair loss science wrong, such as not even knowing what the sulfotransferase enzyme is, it should be obvious that you're getting scammed. It's an obvious red flag. How However, let's go ahead and ignore all that and let's take a look at this Twist 1 stuff and see whether it is something that's worth the hype of this Reddit post or whether it is just another variant of the broccoli hypothesis. Today we're going to find out for sure if Twist 1 is the holy grail of hair loss treatments. But to do that, let's first take a look at the argument that the Tressless post is making. The first study that the post brings up is this one from 2016 titled, quote, Differential expression between human dermal papilla cells from balding and non-balding scalps reveals new candidate genes for androgenetic alopecia, unquote. I always get thrown off when they say androgenetic instead of androgenic, even though both terms are valid. But anyways, in this article, the investigators looked at dermal papilla cells from balding and non-balding human scalps. Now, dermal papilla cells are located at the very bottom of the hair follicle, and they are thought to be what controls the hair cycle as it goes from the antigen growth phase into the telogen resting phase. 
So all the dermal papilla cells used in the study were from the biopsies of men undergoing hair transplantation surgery. So all these men obviously had androgenic alopecia. Two sets of dermal papilla cells were obtained, one from balding regions of the scalp and the other from non-balding regions. These cells were grown in vitro, meaning in a laboratory, and the investigators were interested in seeing what the differences were in gene expression between balding and non-balding hair follicles. So in this figure here, um, we see the abbreviation called BAB, BAB, which means dermal papilla cells from balding regions, as well as BAN, B-A-N, which means dermal papilla cells from normal regions of the hair. You can see that there are a lot of genes that the investigators looked at here, and most were expressed in both balding and non-balding cells. Though some were only expressed in balding and not non-balding cells, as well as vice versa. But this was just a subset of all the genes in the dermal papilla cells. So the investigators decided to look at particular genes that had been associated with androgenic alopecia. So one gene they looked at was the androgen receptor gene, and this gene was upregulated in the balding scalps, which goes along with the fact that androgen receptors are increased in hair follicles from balding regions, which is one of the reasons they are so sensitive to the trash hormone DHT. It's not just higher DHT levels, it's also a higher concentration of androgen receptors as well. Also, the researchers found a number of other genes affected in the balding scalps. One of them was the gene for twist one. This gene was upregulated in the balding scalps as opposed to the non-balding scalps. So it does raise an interesting question as to whether or not twist one plays a role in causing androgenic alopecia. So despite my misgivings with Reddit theories, this one is legitimately interesting. So if twist one is upregulated in balding scalp dermal papilla cells, is there any evidence twist one affects hair growth? Well, to answer that question, the post brings up this study titled, quote, inducible knockout of twist one in young and adult mice prolongs hair growth cycle and has mild effects on general health, supporting twist one as a preferential cancer target, unquote. So yeah, I know what you're thinking. Not another goddamn mouse study. I'd agree that mouse research is not ideal, but unlike the broccoli bullshit, at least we actually have a study here rather than just pointless speculation. Also, the investigators point out that the twist one protein in human beings, as well as mice, is very similar. So this study may have more value than we think initially. Anyways, the investigators in the Reddit post point out that there is a syndrome in humans called sathray chotson syndrome. I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced, but I think so. But anyways, in this syndrome, this is where people are born with a defective twist one protein. People with this syndrome have some skull abnormalities that develop in utero, meaning before they are born. But they also have a low hairline, and the pictures on the Reddit post of people with this syndrome seem to show good hairlines. And so maybe people with this syndrome don't get androgenic alopecia. Though I don't think this is really 100% established since this is such a rare syndrome, and thus it is difficult to draw conclusions by just looking at pictures of people on the internet. So increased twist one is also involved in the mechanisms of a lot of cancers. I mean, if it is involved in cancer and causes hair loss, maybe it's something we could live without. So maybe twist one is a trash protein, just like how DHT is a trash hormone. Well, the investigators in this mouse study looked at this question specifically by creating a strain of mice that lacked the gene for twist one. What they found was that the mice lacking the twist one gene had hair that just stayed stuck in the antigen growth phase, perhaps permanently. This figure here shows that the mice lacking twist one, indicated by the twist one delta slash delta symbol, just stayed in the antigen growth phase, while the other mice who still had the twist one protein entered into the catagen transition phase and then the telogen resting phase as would normally would happen. So the investigators felt that twist one probably was necessary for ending the antigen growth phase and then entering into the catagen transition phase. As is the rule for any hair loss treatment that works, you want it to be able to keep your hair in the antigen growth phase for as long as possible. So any treatment that prolongs the antigen growth phase and shortens the telogen resting phase will result in a reversal of androgenic alopecia. And knocking out the twist one gene seems to do exactly that, at least in mice. The investigators really found no downside to knocking out twist one in these mice. Their general health was good, and all they saw was a slight lower of blood pressure in female mice. So who knows, maybe twist one really is a trash protein. So these investigators concluded, quote, these results clearly indicate that twist one plays an essential role in maintaining the hair growth cycle by converting the antigen phase into the catagen phase, which is then followed by the telogen phase. The loss of twist one function keeps the hair growth cycle at its antigen phase in adult mice, unquote. 
Okay, so like the Reddit post asks, is it really just that simple? Do balding hair follicles just have too much TWIST1 protein, and can we simply just inhibit TWIST1 the same way we inhibit DHT in order to have Norwood 1 hairlines? Well, this is biology we're talking about, so you know it's never that simple. I mean, we're talking about messing around with the delicate mechanics inside the cells, and we already saw how during development, lack of TWIST1 affects skull development, so we have to be very careful with the conclusions we draw here, Chooms. It turns out, though, that all these signaling proteins interact in a very complex way. For example, the Reddit post quotes this article titled, quote, FGF and Wnt signaling interaction and the mesenchymal niche regulates the murine hair cycle clock, unquote. For those who don't know, murine just means mouse. In this study, the authors show that a protein called FGF interacts with the Wnt pathway to trigger off various phases of the hair cycle. And in fact, the twist proteins are actually transcribed by the Wnt pathway. So maybe some of the changes seen in levels of twist one between balding and non-balding scalp are are actually just secondary downstream effects from the changes in the wind pathway during the hair cycle. In fact, if you look at the FGF protein, you can breed mice that lack it, and you get the same effect as what you see when you knock out the twist one gene, as you can see in this figure here, where the mouse on the right is lacking the FGF protein, and it kind of looks like it's growing an afro. It's actually kind of cute. Looks like a sheep mouse, if you ask me. Now, twist one may be a regulator of the FGF protein, so what you end up with is a lot of feedback loops and it is difficult to know what exactly causes what effect. To make things even more complicated, there is evidence that TWIST1 regulates the androgen receptor, but we also know the androgen receptor affects the Wnt pathway, so there are really complicated feedback loops going on here. It turns out that if you disturb one portion of these signaling pathways, you may end up with unintended consequences and collateral effects that, for all we know, could even make hair loss worse. To make things even more complicated than all this, though, there is newer data that the Reddit post didn't cite. This data indicates that TWIST1 may actually be beneficial to hair growth. This study is titled, quote, TWIST1 contributes to the maintenance of some biological properties of dermal papilla cells in vitro by forming with TCF4 and beta-catenin, unquote. In this study, the researchers actually found the opposite of what the previous study showed, namely that the TWIST1 promoted the growth of dermal papilla cells. These investigators looked at cultured dermal papilla cells and found that TWIST1 can combine with other proteins called TCF4 and beta-catenin, which are actually part of the Wnt pathway that helps to stimulate hair growth. The combination of these three proteins stimulated the Wnt pathway and promoted gene expression of various growth factors like VEG F, HGF, and IGF-1. TWIST-1 promoted dermal papilla cell proliferation and the growth factors I just mentioned, so maybe TWIST-1 has both good effects on hair growth and bad effects as well. It's possible it could both promote hair growth factors, but also promote the transition of the antigen growth phase into the catagen transition phase. TWIST-1 may have different effects depending on all the other events going on in the hair growth cycle, because during the hair growth cycle, there is an ever-changing environment within the dermal papilla cells. So even though TWIST-1 is legitimately interesting, interesting, you have to understand that when you look at mechanistic data, oftentimes you're only seeing a fraction of what is happening at the cellular level. The same signaling protein may be both harmful or beneficial based on the conditions, and that is why actual human data is needed to see how this theory translates into practice. And frankly, I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised if this turns out to be a dead end. Let's face it, Chooms, we're talking about genetics and molecular biology here, which are very complex, and it's easy to just get blown away by all the terminology and intricacies. However, one of the articles the Reddit post cites, this one right here specifically, is a really good review of the state of the art of the genetics for androgenic alopecia. At least it was back in 2016 when the article was written. So, people often accuse hair loss research of progressing at a glacial pace, but we've come a long way from the original theory of the inheritance of androgenic alopecia proposed by Dorothy Osborne back in 1916. She proposed that androgenic alopecia was inherited as a dominant trait in men and a recessive trait in women. We know now that there are a lot of genes involved. In fact, genes from 12 separate regions of our DNA have been identified that are linked to androgenic alopecia. Remember, when we're talking about the genetic basis for androgenic alopecia, we're talking about trying to explain four different distinct phenomena.
Number one, why is androgenic alopecia androgen dependent? Meaning why does the trash hormone DHT trigger off the whole process of androgenic alopecia? Number two, why is hair loss usually confined to specific areas of the scalp, namely the vertex and temporal regions? I say usually though because there are irregular forms of androgenic alopecia, like diffuse thinning or retrograde alopecia, which are still forms of androgenic alopecia that can be treated with conventional treatments like finasteride and minoxidil. Number three, why does the androgen growth phase shorten and why is there a premature entry into the catagen transition phase which is the phase between the growth phase and the telogen resting phase when the hair is shed. Number four, why does hair progressively become thinner and smaller with each hair cycle so that the hair converts from normal terminal thick healthy hairs into miniaturized vellus hairs? Fortunately, we live in the 21st century, so we know there is a genetic basis to all these phenomena, and so we don't have to invoke some obsolete debunked theories like blood flow, scalp tension, skull expansion, or dental malocclusion to explain any of these phenomena seen in androgenic alopecia. These theories are universally scamful. All four features of androgenic alopecia that we just listed are 100% genetically predetermined. So what are these genes related to androgenic alopecia that have been identified? Well here is the human genome and the red arrows point to all the gene locations that seem to be related to androgenic alopecia. There are 12 locations and one of them is the androgen receptor gene, though this gene is on the X chromosome which is the gene that men get only from their mothers. So this gene by itself can't explain why we frequently inherit baldness from our fathers. It's also not clear why a defective androgen receptor gene would just cause hair loss and not affect all the other places in our bodies where androgens are important. So clearly there are other genes involved in the inheritance of androgenic alopecia. The other 11 gene locations are on non-sex related genes. Some of these involve obscure proteins most people haven't heard of. Many of these gene locations are in what are called non-coding areas where the DNA doesn't actually code for any proteins. These areas are sometimes called junk DNA. So going bald seems to be due to junk DNA and trash hormones like DHT in the body, so likely the existence of androgenic alopecia is just an evolutionary accident. Nature and evolution is not perfect after all, and it can make some very, very big mistakes sometimes. Some of these gene sites associated with androgenic alopecia are related to the wind pathway. Also, both twist 1 and twist 2 genes may be involved along with a set of genes called HDAC genes. The article has a figure that the Reddit post uses and says, quote, this renders a functional interaction between HDAC4, HDAC9, twist1, and twist2 during androgenic alopecia development likely, which may contribute to the androgen-induced follicle miniaturization and the observed antigen shortening and premature catagen entry." Unquote. So this is all very complicated, but it does imply that twist1 and also probably twist2 are involved in androgenic alopecia. So the Reddit post mentioned that there is a group buy for some anti-twist treatment. So is it time to invest in this secret group by the Reddit post likes to talk about? Well, personally, I wouldn't. And here's why. It looks like the twist genes are most important during fetal development specifically, and probably the scalp hairs that are destined to miniaturize are already doomed when we are in our mother's uteruses. As the article states here, quote, this is particularly important in male androgenic alopecia, where the clinical balding phenotype is only seen in selected androgen-sensitive hair follicle subpopulations in stringently defined regions of scalp skin. This phenomenon may be attributable to the developmental priming of the hair follicle mesenchyme in these selected skin regions during cutaneous embryogenesis." Unquote. That's right, just like twist 1 is important to create normal skull bones, it might also create the androgen sensitive hair follicles on the top of our heads that will be destined to miniaturize and die off once we get our surge of DHT during adolescence. So maybe some drug affecting twist 1 or FGF or the Wnt pathway or maybe the sonic hedgehog pathway will eventually come along to help us in our battle against the Norwood Reaper but I doubt this is the easy solution that the Reddit post hopes it will be. In the meantime, we already have fantastic drugs like finasteride and dutasteride that can reduce the trash hormone DHT as well as a good general growth stimulant like minoxidil. A lot of times the fascination with these theoretical treatments like twist one inhibitors is based on people's fear about conventional treatments, which is completely unjustified as the research has proven time after time again that 5-AR inhibitors are completely safe and the overwhelming majority of people who use them will not experience any adverse effects whatsoever. Of course, 
I'm always in favor of new innovations in hair loss treatments, and I have created many videos talking about these promising treatments in the pipeline, so hopefully we'll have more tools in the good fight in the future, and I don't completely count out Twist One as being important. It's definitely not something like the broccoli scam, which is just stupid and completely fraudulent, but at the moment, I don't think it's going to be the magic bullet against hair loss either. It's definitely interesting, but I think the majority of the hype for future hair loss treatments should be directed towards androgen degraders like GT2009, as well as topical androgen antagonists like pyrolutamide. This Twist One inhibitor is just too theoretical, and the research is way too preliminary to get too excited about, at least right now. So that's my take on it. Hope you found it interesting, and we'll be back with more preem content soon in our good fight against the slaphead curse. So see you next time, hair loss witchers. Take care.